This is what Jimmy needs to do. He needs to start thinking about being on the outside, pressuring inwards, looking for the double leg, gets the aerial oh, slam! What a take down there from Jimmy Fell. High amplitude. Got Wombs immediately into side control. See what he can do from here. Looking for the mount straight away. Knee on the belly. And this full is mount. smart on Jimmy's part. He's taken the fight to the ground. Reese is known for his strike, and now he's in the full mount. High full mount, pounding in his punches in, Mark. Absolutely. He's dropping bombs here. Referee AJ Jeffrey looking on. Wombs, he needs to move, needs to get out of here. Not defending very intelligently at the moment. He's getting pounded here from Fell. Reese needs to work his hips, start bucking in this position. And start moving his hips from here. He needs to start thinking about breaking down the posture of Jimmy. The whole time Jimmy is upright like that, he can fire down these punches with maximum power. And that's it, the fight's over. Right, okay, so hi, welcome back to Featuring Regular People. This is episode six. Today we're talking to Mr. Jimmy Fell. He is an upcoming UK MMA prospect, currently the holder of the Cage Warriors Academy Southeast Amateur Featherweight title and also the Contenders Amateur Featherweight champion as well. How you doing, mate? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Thank you for coming on. Um, yeah, uh, man, pleasure. massively appreciate it. Obviously, uh, me and Luke... Thanks for having me on. Me and Luke are both uh, like bang into our martial arts and that, so we wanted to get someone from that sort of world on as soon as possible. And then when I spoke to Ben, and I obviously a while ago you'd done that little one-two run with him. All right, yeah. And I was like, after I'd done the one with Ben, I was like, do you reckon I'd be able to get that geezer on? He was like, yeah, drop him a message. So I dropped you a message, and yeah, thank you for getting back to me, mate. Oh, uh, brilliant. Yeah, no problem at all. And I just uh, sat watching uh, some more of your fights this morning, uh, which was yeah. a nice little adrenaline booster for the day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Proper makes you want to do a workout, doesn't it, watching that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose we'll jump straight into it, mate. Obviously, I saw um, just off something that you said to Ben, that you've been boxing since you're about 13, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. But when did the switch to MMA sort of happen? Uh, that happened, uh, 20, yeah, December 2016, so about four, just over four years ago now. Okay. Yeah, uh, I started boxing at about 13, 14. Um, did that for well about eight, eight, ten years, something like that. Mm. Um, and then I was actually off injured for a, a while uh, from the boxing, and I just I couldn't get anything going. I couldn't train properly or anything. And my my younger brother was training at the gym I train at now, and he said, "Why don't you come down and do a bit of grappling? It's a little bit easier on you. You know, there's not much running, things like that. It might be a bit better for you." So I went down there, and my coach Windy he ended up saying to me. Or well, we've got like an injury specialist. Why don't you go and see him and uh, see how you get on? And he managed to fix me. <laughs> uh, Jim, Jim Hurd. Yeah, Jim Hurd is my offset path. He's one of my sponsors now. He's a great guy. I mean, I go and see him probably every six weeks. He keeps me on the mat. He keeps me training. Yeah. And then after that, I moved into MMA just because I was there training anyway. And yeah, it kind of went really well. So. <laughs> Clearly. Just discovered that there was a hidden talent there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that's what was interesting. Luke actually mentioned it after I sent him some videos of the fights. Obviously, so you started boxing first and you've got like eight, ten years of striking under your belt. But yeah. in all your fights, you're predominantly like a wrestler, a grappler. Yeah, to, to be honest with you, that's just because of who we fought and what the game plan was going in. Um, we're very, very clever in our gym in the way that we approach things. We don't do everything the same way. We look at every single opponent and we come up with a game plan specifically for them. And it, it just so happens that everyone I thought it was in our interest to grapple with them. Yeah. Um, and like a few of the, yeah. I mean, a few of the guys were really good strikers. And it's like, well, I could stay and strike with you and I could probably win. But I know that's what you want to do. So I'm going yeah. to put you on the ground because you don't want to be there. And then for my last two opponents, it's just been a case of they're such good grapplers that it's like, it's going to end up on the ground anyway. So we just need to accept that and, and work on it. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just been sort of, Fortunate or unfortunate, however you look at it, that that's just how it's, that's just how it's played out. But. And I mean, you look pretty solid uh, going to ground with people as well. So I was kind of under the assumption that that was your, you know, your natural style of fighting as well. Um, so it's kind of nice actually to realise that you're more of a striker uh, yeah. naturally. Yeah, and I mean, to be honest with you, at Blue Wave where I train is predominantly a grappling gym anyway. It's, it's mainly jiu-jitsu, so that is probably what the bulk of my training is, which kind of helped for having to sort of fill that gap when I first started. Um, but yeah, it's just one of them things, you know. Eventually, it will come a time when I do have to strike with someone, and, and we'll see how we'll see how that goes. But we're not gonna, we're, I, we'll never do something just to prove we can. Do you know what I mean? Because that's when you yeah. make mistakes. 
and you lose fights for something you shouldn't do, really. So I think that's like a big thing in the MMA world. I don't know if you saw it recently. So Curtis Blades obviously fought last night, and he's predominantly yeah. a wrestler. And then mm. there's a big thing, especially with like the American fan base. They're like, no, we want to see a good fight. We want to see an interesting yeah, fight. Yeah. He came out and said he was like, at the end of the day, I'm fighting for like money to feed my family. So I'm not going to do what you want me to do just because it's oh, yeah. interesting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, when you're fighting Derek Lewis as well, you, you can't you can't do that. Do you know what I mean? Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing with striking, with grappling. It's you know you can get a submission out of almost anywhere, and that can happen quite quickly. With a with a with striking, you know, a punch can come out of nowhere. You don't even see it, and before you know it, you're on the floor. Yeah, absolutely. It's that's the thing with sort of striking and grappling. But when people sort of say, "Oh no, we want to see a good fight. We want to see this. We want to see that," you know. People sort of moan about grappling if they don't understand it and they don't like seeing it, but everyone still watches Khabib. Yeah, well, that's it. When I first got into the sport, like, as with everyone, you're like, you want to see a striking contest because it's easier to sort of know what you're watching. But yeah, when you get yeah. into the grappling and stuff and you're watching, like, two high-level grapplers, like, it's like watching a game of human chess. I think that's something people say a lot, like. Yeah. Because you can just, at any minute, you're like, he's going to get his arm bent off or his knee to Oh, yeah. Up. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it is. A lot of people just don't actually understand what's going on, and they don't understand what it feels like to be grappling like that. Like they sort of you hear it a lot. Oh, he's just laying on him. He's laying there, and he's not. He's actively crushing the life out of him. It's actually, yeah. quite it's actually really like when you get someone who's got good top pressure and they're on top of you like that, and you can't breathe. It really changes how you view grappling. You know, yeah. once you've experienced it. Um, when I first started jiu-jitsu, I, you know, I'd, I'd fought before, and I thought oh, I'd be okay. You know, I'm not going to be any good at it, but it'd be all right. And you, you just realise how insignificant you are as a person. Yeah. When you're half your size, you can just throw you around like a rag doll. Yeah. And we've got um, people, we've got like uh, Laura, her name is. She's tiny. She's about four foot nine, <laughs> probably about four stone. And we have great big blokes come in the gym and they think they're going to be all right. And Laura just chokes them unconscious. Yeah. Or, uh, she, <laughs> them unconscious. She, chokes, she just chokes them, they're nearly unconscious. And they're like, they look a horror on their face when they get choked out by yeah. someone who looks like 12. And you're like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> that's why that? it's so cool, though, man. Like, the size difference just... Well, that's why, like, obviously, Hoist Gracie, he kind of personified that and changed the way MMA, like, was fought back in the day by, like, submitting people twice his size, like Ken Shamrock and that. And that kind oh, of... Oh, yeah. That really developed MMA into what it is now, where, like, everybody's got to be good everywhere. Like, be as good oh, yeah. as you want. If you haven't got a ground game, you're not really going to get so far these days. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the days of being good at one thing are kind of gone, but it's almost sort of coming back round now because you get, like, obviously, you had guys who sort of specialised in just one thing, and then everyone started getting good at everything. But then you look at guys like Khabib now or Adesanya, you know, they can yeah. do everything, but they're so dominant in one area that you just can't beat it. Yeah. Anyway. yeah you know what I mean, exactly. it's almost sort of coming back round full circle again in some ways. Yeah, big but, time. Well, they're my like favourite people to watch, like the Adesanyas, the Wonder Boys, but. You know, if you can't get past their hands, then you can't really test them. But it's interesting, yeah. man. I like the uh, Adesanya Costa fight was brilliant because everyone was like, Costa will just take him down. But for like, yeah. considering he's predominantly a striker, he's still got a good bit of takedown defense about him. And if you can't get him down, then you're not going to know. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like with strikers, it, unless they actually train to do takedown defense, I don't know how to do it. But they've only got to add that in there, and all of a sudden they're a problem. Yeah. It's really hard to get near someone to take them down when they're going to kick you in the face. <laughs> 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 it really does matter and works, so. Yeah, definitely. I was going to say, I bet it uh, just I completely throws you off because obviously as much as, you know, you've got a game plan and you're used to, you know, sparring in this kind of way with people, um, just taking one of those blows, like it must just completely change your mindset in terms of like, ah, you know, shit, I need to adapt in this way very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even when you're on the ground, it can happen as well. You know, I think there's another saying that Wendy used to say to us was, the way you turn a black belt into a white belt is you punch them in the face. You'll see guys who are world-class black belts in MMA and they're underneath and they're doing really silly things like they're sticking an arm out, they're turning their back, things like that because they're getting hit. Yeah. You're just in panic and you, you can't think clearly. Um, and That's yeah, it, just, it can really sort of mess with your head. Big time. We see there's all like videos on Instagram and stuff of people looking wicked, like hitting the bag and stuff like that. But it's like, yeah. Yeah, that all changes when you see how you can take a hit. Oh, yeah. No, actually, I mean, bags don't hit back, do you? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, no, you'll always beat a bag. <laughs> yeah. With um, your, like, career so far then, so you're six fights, five and one, yeah? Yeah, that's right, as an average, yeah. What's been your personal highlight, would you say? 
personal highlight was probably uh, it was probably my last fight beating George Tenas of yeah. um, for the Cage Warriors belt. Uh, actually, not the champion there anymore because pretty much immediately after that, we decided I was going to turn pro. So we relinquished oh, that belt, and, and they had a yeah, yeah they had a one night tournament to see who's going to get it. Um, a guy called Yuki won it from Brad Pickett's gym, so he's now the champion of that. I'll give him his. <laughs> I'll, sort of, I'll address that before someone shouts at me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that that was probably the highlight of it purely because you know Cage Warriors Southeast is probably it's one of the best amateur shows you can go on, probably the best in the country. They got guys coming from all over Europe to fight on there. Yeah, um, you, you know you don't get any mugs on there. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And fighting George, who is um, you know he was, he was like a European champion wrestler. His wrestling is ridiculous. He's from BKK Fighters, who are one of the best gyms in the country. <laughs> they got Arnold Allen come out of there. They have John McGuire training there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Steve Angle, Craig Woods, they got and Jack Mason is their coach. Uh, they've got Nick there for the wrestling as well. They've got so many good guys coming out of there. It's such a good gym. So to beat him was that was definitely the highlight. Yeah, that's wicked. And that was obviously your last fight. So looking to go yeah. pro, you're gonna have your pro fight this year, hopefully. Yeah, I mean we, we were ready to fight sort of February, March last year, and then obviously um COVID sort of messed everything up. Yeah. Um I've trained, <coughs> yeah, I've been training as much as I possibly can, trying to keep sort of active and there have been a few shows happening like the main cage warriors has been happening they've been doing shows um throughout all the lockdowns they get sort of government exempt i'm not sure how we've been trying to get on there it just hasn't happened you know um i was gonna say like they're with like the lockdown and COVID and stuff like obviously ufc was the that was the first sport to come back like they were hot on it and like mma kind of taken precedence over a lot of other sports but how have you found like staying motivated with the lockdown and like no fights on the horizon it's hard you know the only thing that sort of kept me going is just that it is my job now you know i trained full time i was doing that before um it is my job you know so i can do that the, the hardest thing has been sort of training with, without the gym without sparring partners just sort of do it on your own you can only do the same things every day yeah that's the hardest bit you know you just got to try and stay disciplined and do it as much as you can don't be wrong i broken it a few times and I haven't trained for a while and things like that same as everyone but mm. everyone at the minute I think has just got to do the best they can with what they got yeah absolutely. And that's all you can do so obviously you yeah I mean it was a um ah sorry can't go for it go on go on go on no what I was gonna um say I mean it was after that kind of uh you know when the first lockdown ended and the the gyms kind of reopened but it yeah. was still you know um you were able to kind of go into the gym and train but I found it where you couldn't actually, or one, you couldn't spar with people. Um, Two, you know, you can't really be in that close contact with people. So it just kind of changes the game a little bit, doesn't it? And there was, like you were saying, you know, there's only one thing that you can really do. Um, And have you found that that's kind of affected um, the way that your mindset is at the moment, you know, having those kind of restrictions around? Not really, no. Again, it's just one of them things. It's like, okay, I can't do this. I might as well, like, we couldn't do much grappling, couldn't do anything like that. So it was just, okay, we just work on the striking as much as we can, you know. Um, that's, that's all you can do. There's nothing you can do about yeah. it. So just keep working on that. I think my striking's improved um, substantially during this period because that's all I've been focusing on, but that's going to happen. Um, yeah, there's, there's not a lot else you can do. It, yeah. Uh, as far as the mindset <laughs> goes. As far as your mindset goes, it's just frustrating, you know. It's just, you know, it's just annoying. It's just annoying. But yeah, itching to get back at it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's. That's what I was going to um, ask you. So you're obviously fight at featherweight, 145. Yeah. What are you walking around at? At the minute, I'm walking around about 160, oh, which okay. is pretty high for me. I usually walk around about 155. Um, to get to featherweight, I don't really cut any weight at all. Um, I think for the last two fights, I actually woke up on weight on the okay. morning of weigh-in. So I don't do... I've done a weight cut once because my first fight ended up being at 155 because my opponent pulled out at the last minute. So we had a guy come in, he goes, oh, I want it at 155. And he said, okay, fine, we'll do it. So my first time at 145 after that, I thought, okay, I'll stay at 155 and I'll cut the weight just to experience it because everyone does it. There must be a thing to it. And it felt like shit. Like, it was awful. <laughs> It was only ten pounds as well, like well, it wasn't even ten pounds. It was probably like six or seven on the day, of, like sweating off and things like that. Yeah. 
and I just felt like death. I was just like, I'm not doing this again. It's not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> so now, I mean, I, yeah, I wake up for the last, well, last two fights. I woke up at 146, 145. So I haven't had to cut any weight. I'm considering going to 135, just depending on what fights are there. Yeah. Um, just because that will mean, but that will mean, mean me doing a weight cut. But I suppose that just puts me on the same sort of page as everybody else who's cutting weight, if you know what yeah, I mean. absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll see who comes up and what happens. But I think at the start, being able to sort of jump between two weight classes will just get me a few more opportunities to fight and we'll see where the better division is for me. Yeah, definitely. I think at the moment with the way it is as well, like the most successful fighters seem to be the ones who are just willing to fight whatever weight, wherever and whenever and whoever. Yeah, to a degree. Um, yeah, I know what you mean, but it depends on how you look at it. I mean, I, I'm not mad fast on just getting fights whenever. Do you know what I mean? We're not like that in our gym. We're, we're quite happy to say no to a fight if it's not right. Um, there's nothing worse, in my opinion, than losing a fight that you shouldn't have lost just because you weren't quite prepared. You know, yeah. if you take a fight on two weeks' notice and you get in there and you go, yes, yeah, so if we if we did if we did a full count, we'd have beaten them easily. You just sort of think, well, you haven't actually got anything from that loss. If you lose because something wasn't ready, you know, your wrestling wasn't good enough, your cardio wasn't good enough, or you know, you got caught with a mistake or whatever, you can learn from that, you can deal with that. But yeah. if you just lost because oh, I wasn't ready, then you're not gaining anything from that. It's just a waste of time, really. Well, mate, that's quite an admirable perspective because not many, I haven't heard many fighters come out and say something like that. Like, you seem quite willing to, like, approach things slowly but sensibly just so you know you're at your best. Yeah, no, it's, 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 what, it's what we are in our gym. It's what Wendy's, you know, Wendy's head coach and that's what his sort of ethos is. We don't take losses. We don't need to. Um, you know, even if you win a fight, you're still probably getting hit in the head a few times and you want to avoid that as much as possible. So... It's just sort of, it just seems sort of silly now because in the past when I've fought, like, especially when I've boxing, you would take fights on short notice and, you know, I lost a few fights that I probably wouldn't have done if I'd have, if I'd have known who the guy was. Yeah. You know, I got out there and he's left-handed and you think, oh, right, okay, now I've got to deal with that and it's it's quite hard to adjust to those things on the fly. You know, you, you have to be able to do it but it's quite difficult. I know there are gyms out there and there are fighters out there who will just fight anyone, anywhere, anytime and I, I completely admire that. And it, it, you know, it, it does take guts and things like that. It's just not the approach we take. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but that's just what makes us sort of different, I think. Every gym has their own way of doing things. Some gyms will do the same thing. It doesn't matter who the opponent is. And a lot of really good fighters, I mean, you look at Khabib, he does the same thing every fight and no one can beat him. Yeah. You know, so you, I, I'm no, I'd never say anything's wrong, but it's just not how we do things. We adjust, we change, we adapt. We don't just sort of force the same thing, but, you know, everyone's got their way of doing it. Yeah. Well, your fight with George, um, I was reading about something you said, and it was like, like this is another thing, mate. Like, you're clearly quite honest, like, because not a lot of fighters would say something like this, but you said he was the better athlete than you, but you mm -hmm. were better prepared. Like, yeah. you knew he couldn't go well against Southpaws, so you switched your whole stance for the fight. Yeah, no, it was... Um... Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not the most athletic bloke in the world. I mean, you see some of the guys in the gym and they can they can do things that I've got no chance of doing. Like, yeah. It just doesn't happen and it's really annoying. But, you know, we get around that by being cleverer. You know, we we watched George, we studied George for months before we fought him. And we saw, we actually went to go and see him fight uh, in person. We went to Cage Warriors when he was on there and we went to watch him from Cage side, which is really good as well. And, we, you know, we noticed things. We noticed that he didn't do well when things weren't going his way. Um, he started to panic a little bit. Um, we noticed that he didn't deal well when people started changing things up on him. Um, we also noticed his cardio. So it was like, okay, and we just built a strategy around that. Um, yeah, and it paid off. So that's, yeah, all, you really. that's all you can do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about as well. Um, so you're quite uh, like an advocate of uh, being vegan, uh, from what I've seen. So yeah. you say a lot of things about being a vegan athlete. When did you go vegan or have you always been and how have you found that's affected you physically? Uh, I went vegan, I think about a month after I started training in MMA. It, there was, it was nothing to do with the MMA, it was just coincidence. Mm. Um, I'd sort of thought about it for a long time and then I just, I think I just decided to do it um, and I just sort of went into it. To be honest with you, it was never really a health decision or anything like that. It was purely an ethics thing. I like animals, you know, I keep a lot of animals, I don't want to hurt them, I've got no interest in it. Yeah. Um, and it was just from, a long time I had this kind of thing of I wouldn't want to kill an animal and then eat it like if I had yeah. two to eat it so I shouldn't really be eating it just because someone else is doing it for me like yeah. if you were to give me a chicken and say right you've got to kill that so you can eat I'd go 
nah, mate, that's out of order. I'm not <laughs> doing it. <laughs> I just want, I'm, I'm more like the keeper who's a pet, do you know what I mean? But, yeah, yeah, definitely. So that kind of made me feel a bit funny about eating it just because it's in a packet on a shelf. And I think with a lot of people nowadays, if you were to sort of say to them, look, you've got to kill that animal to eat it, they couldn't do it. They couldn't bring themselves to kill something. Yeah. But they will eat it because it's in a packet on a shelf. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just made up to look completely different and, you know, normal. Yeah, think, and, uh, yeah, it's just non-violent. Think of it as meat rather than animal, which, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to preach about it. It's not my thing. It's a choice mm. I make. I always encourage people to try it and give it a go. A few guys in the gym have tried it and they sort of asked me about it and things like that. And most of them have sort of stuck, not stuck to it, but they've stuck with it for a while or they've sort of reduced their meat consumption, which is a win in my book. Yeah. As far as how does it affect me, I found that I've, I kept weight off a lot easier because when I boxed, I always boxed a bit heavier than I did when I fought MMA, mainly because they have same day weigh-ins. But I just found that when I went vegan, it was a lot easier to keep the weight off. Um, I also felt that I wasn't hungry as much because vegan food or plant-based food tends to be a lot more voluminous just by nature and a lot lower calories so I can eat more and not gain the weight. Um, yeah, and I started eating more veg, which is no bad thing. So <laughs> yeah. it, just, it, just sort of, it just sort of worked well for me as well because I, I do a lot of cardio, so I eat a really high-carb diet anyway, and that's what a vegan diet tends to be. It's quite high-carb, so... I think there was just a good bit of synergy there. It just kind of worked for me. A lot of guys I know, they are very high protein diet, very sort of, sort of almost keto diet. I know a couple of guys in the gym who are carnivores and they only eat meat. It's not gonna, it probably wouldn't work for them. No. And we give each other a lot of stick over it, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's never a personal thing. It's, for me, it's, it's just, it's my decision. If anyone wants to make that decision or try it out, I'll always encourage them and help them out and give them advice. But, yeah, you know. I think that's the best way to be about it. I mean, so my girlfriend's vegan. We obviously live together and I, so I don't eat dairy just because it fuck, does, yeah. my stomach, it does my stomach bits, mate. Like, yeah. loads of spots when I eat it and that. So I don't eat dairy. I do occasionally still eat meat, but like, because my girlfriend went vegan, I just sort of started trying things that I wouldn't normally try. Yeah, and yeah. And I, like, I'll happily admit, I used to be that ignorant mindset of like, oh no, I fucking love meat. Like, why would I ever not eat yeah. it? Yeah. But I think once you get out of that mindset and start opening yourself up to just trying things, like, yeah, it's just, uh, it's worth giving a go for sure. And I know, like, in the, these days, loads of people do try and have, like, meat-free Mondays and all stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even if it was just, like, you know, you cut it down a couple of days a week or you, it just makes you try other things, you know? And then I think even if you do go back to eating meat, you start eating more things. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, just, just a, having more of that variety. Yeah, exactly. And again, if you know, if you if you cut your meat down a couple of days a week, that's still helping. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. cut them with less cows killed a year, probably. Yeah, exactly. It's not much, but I'm sure the cow appreciates it. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of your like career going forward, what are your like long term goals? Uh, I mean, I want to be. I mean, I'll say it now. I want to be the best in the world, and I thoroughly believe I can be. Um, there are people out there who will laugh at that and say you've got no chance but when we decided that I was going to go professional I spoke to Wendy about it and we spoke to a couple of other coaches as well and we made the decision that basically we will continue to keep competing and keep fighting and keep going until we reach a point where I can't go any higher if we get to a point where you know what I'm just not good enough I can't cut it at this level then we'll stop um, because I'm not going to stick around and take a beat in and get my head kicked in for a living and become a journeyman I'm just not going to do that it's not what I'm about it's not what we're about but you know, until I reach a level where I think, you know what, he was just way too good, I'm never going to be able to beat that, then I'm going to keep going. And I thoroughly believe I can make the UFC. I think I could be world champion one day. We're just, we're just going to see. We're going to take it one fight at a time. You know, I'm never, we, we never look past anyone. It's just going to be one fight at a time and we're just going to keep going until we can't go any further. Yeah, well, you say, mate, like people, people will laugh at that, but if you're in a sport where you're, you know, taking damage for a living essentially you have yeah. to have that mindset you can't go into it thinking anything other than i'm going to be the best because as soon yeah, as yeah. you do that you're not gonna you know do yourself justice yeah no i mean i think all fighters to a degree have a bit of narcissism minimum and a little bit of that i mean you have to be arrogant to a degree um <laughs> just to have that full belief in yourself because you go in there if you go in there doubting or not believing you're going to lose Mm. Um, you know, and, and at the same time, you sort of have to be grounded enough to realise that you do have limits, and there are only so many things you can do. But you know, you just got to have that belief that you, you can do it, and it's just a case of put, performing when it matters. So it's kind of finding that balance. You know, you got to be sort of you got to have that kind of blind faith in yourself, and at the same time, you got to have that ability to sort of say, no, 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 we got to manage this and come back to earth a little bit. Yeah, 
So definitely, it's a it's a good time for UK fighters as well. There seems to obviously you've got like the legends like you mentioned earlier, Brad Pickett and Michael Bisping and that like they're the yeah. household UK names that people would know. But then more and more you've got like Darren Till breaking through, Lerone Murphy, Tom yeah. Upton, all these up and coming lads and like Arnold Allen, another one you mentioned earlier. Like more and more, yeah. I think the UFC are looking to the UK kind of market of fighters. So it's a good time. Yeah, for yeah. Them. Yeah, no, absolutely, and it. So you've got the more people we get from the UK, sort of going onto that big stage, the more popular it's going to get. Um, and also, you've got shows like Cage Warriors that are like sending so many fighters to the UFC. Well, Mason and, Jones just went over, didn't he? Yeah, Mason Jones just went over there. Jack Shaw went over there. They're all doing really, really well. And it just shows you the sort of caliber of fighters that you actually have in the UK now. It used to be, you know, you had Michael Bisping and Dan Hardy, and that was about it. Really, you had a few sort of guys on the sort. Of, on the European level, nothing at that level, but it just shows you how high the standard is in the UK now. Um, and it's just, it's just going to get better. Yeah, it's blowing up in interest, I think. I mean, obviously, Luke Luke trains a bit of kickboxing. I do a bit of Muay Thai. Obviously, not at the moment because the gyms are shut, but... Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to get back. Yeah, trust me, Matt. I think combat sports have really blown up in the last couple of years in this country. Definitely, there's gyms popping up everywhere. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, as you get the sort of the bigger shows getting more popular, people start putting on their own sort of smaller shows and then more people get into it. You know, I mean, Windy, my coach, when he first started, because he brought Jiu-Jitsu to the area, like where we are, there wasn't, yeah. it wasn't here before. And, you know, at that point, it was like, when he wanted to train, he'd have to go down to London and train. You know, so there were areas where there was no nowhere to do it. And I think the, the more it spreads, you'll get more areas that then can train and you'll just, you just get a bigger pool of people actually doing it. And you know, it's just law of averages. You're going to get good people out of it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The more people, do it's an it. exciting time, though. Yeah, absolutely, really exciting time. And um, that's one thing I wanted to ask about Blue Wave. So that's uh, Windy's gym, is it? And you're a coach there as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, we had uh, the gym in. Well, we was at the gym in Berry, based out of Unit One Gym, okay. which is a Muay Thai gym, uh, and Windy was running that. And then as I came through, I started doing a little bit of coaching. And then it was actually middle of last year, just after the first lockdown ended, we had the opportunity to um, start a new place, uh, a gym in Newmarket called Asgard. Mm -hmm. And that's where the sort of Blue Wave headquarters moved to now. And I went into partnership with Windy on that and I coach there now. And that's what sort of allowed me to sort of train full time and coach full time is doing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we've got sort of two locations now that are really good. Got sort of full set up. Um, with sort of uh, with cages and well, with fence and everything like that, the bag and everything. And um, we're just waiting to get back there now to, to keep running it. But yeah, it's it's Windy's gym. I just it's, it's always yeah, it's, it's always going to be Windy's. You know, no matter who's coaching there or who goes into it, it's, it's Windy's. You know, it's yeah. it's his baby. He built it. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. I think it's because uh, I've well, like, I've got loads of younger brothers and sisters, and I'm because obviously my family live around Newmarket. So yeah. I'm itching to get my little brother down there at some point to get him doing something because I think it's such a good thing. Like, even if you've not got any sort of, you don't want to like get into fighting or whatever, I think just from like a physical and a mental standpoint, like combat yeah. sports are such a good thing to train. Yeah, no, in terms of, sort of fitness, it's great. Discipline is great. I think just self-confidence as well and being able to defend yourself you know it's you know it can get rough it, it can be a rough place out there sometimes even in nice areas you know where i live is it's quite a nice area and you still hear things awful things sometimes and you think mm. bloody hell like what is going on so just being able to defend yourself i think everyone should do it especially kids as well i definitely think kids should be, te should be taught it from a young age we do a lot of kids classes and they all sort of improve all the parents say they're getting more in confident they get more confident and they get more focused and things after a couple of weeks. And it just gives you that. Yeah, it feeds into the other areas of your life. Luke, I'm sure you could probably speak on this as well, mate. But, like, I was a smaller, not-so-confident kid growing up. And, like, sort of getting into... I did boxing when I was younger and then got into more, more recently. And it just... The confidence and energy you get from that does benefit all the other aspects of your life that you wouldn't even think of initially. Yeah, absolutely. It's just... Um... Yeah, I just think it's a really great thing for anybody to do, even if you're not going to compete. And I find as well that usually people are terrified to go into those gyms. It's a bit of a cliche. People are terrified to go into fight gyms or martial arts gyms. They're usually the most friendly places you can find. Yeah. You know? um, you've only got to look at sort of like a jiu-jitsu Instagram page and you see all the memes on there of people. like The, the sort of blokes you get at jiu-jitsu, they're always geeks, they're always nerds, they're always weirdos. 
and they're just not and they'll beat the daylights out of you but yeah. they're friendly the <laughs> they're the sort of people who got bullied at school and then they started doing martial arts yeah big time big time realise they can twist. I mean I think it's one of them as well I mean especially for me uh, I mean kickboxing um, I did um, you know some martial arts when I was younger but the kickboxing has been quite a, a relatively new thing um, however I find that Obviously, the physical benefits are, you know, obvious, the clear to see. Um, it is a absolutely killer session after you come out and you're like, yeah, I worked really hard and I can feel it. But I think the mental, uh, the benefits, you know, are incredible as well. Um, you know, when you are frustrated, angry, happy, any kind of emotion that you go in, it just kind of elevates it or completely switches around. Um, and that's why, like, you know, when I've been speaking to friends, I think it's, you know, always try to encourage people to go into a gym. If you don't want to compete, like Khan said, you know, just go and do it anyway. Um, not the competing, I mean the training. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, just the, the benefits for your mental health. Um, I mean, in my own, it's, yeah, it's just tenfold better. Yeah, in terms of your mental health, I don't think there's anything that can beat it. It's so good for you. Um, during the lockdown and that, when you, when you can't train, there's a reason why people are struggling with it. It's because they can't do all these things that give them that boost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One, uh, so your name on Instagram is Tomahawk MMA. Yeah, got that mental tattoo on your chest, mate. Like, yeah. <laughs> where does the uh, interest in that sort of uh, Native American culture come from? What's the idea behind that? Uh, honestly, I just, I just liked it. I just saw, I saw a lot of artwork by it. I saw a lot of their stuff, um, and I, I just thought it was awesome. Uh, the guy who does my tattoos, Billy, who trains with me, really good guy. Um, I basically, I told him the sort of idea of what I wanted and where I wanted it, and I just said, you do your thing, and he came up with that, and it was wicked. And then it was basically, I was getting a like a walkout hoodie done by one of the guys in the gym, and he yeah. put on my sponsor, and he goes, what is your nickname? And I didn't have one at the time. And I was like, well, we haven't got one yet. And he's like, you've got to have a nickname. I'm not putting you a fucking walkout hoodie with no name on it. <laughs> And then uh, one of the guys in the gym just sort of shouted it out because of the type. Because um, I think we were doing no gear. I didn't have my shirt on at the time. And yeah, yeah, they told me they, they shouted that out, and we went with that. And it just kind of stuck with that. So <laughs> that's wicked. That's wicked. Yeah, I'm gonna have to earn the nickname somehow. I'm gonna have to cut someone open or something like that with an elbow. Well, you'll, you'll have to do something mental in a fight. Yeah. Then maybe get that first big knockout. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to cut someone with an elbow or. or yeah. Anything. Or something like that, trying to earn that nickname, but we'll see what happens with the time. I'm sure it will find its own way of fitting you soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say there's plenty of time uh, to, to kind of make that happen. Yeah. So in terms of short term, what's what's next for you now over sort of the next few months? Um, just basically try and keep in shape and as ready to fight as possible. I mean, fitness wise, I'm always ready to fight. It's just a case of does the right fight come up at the right time? Um, and then we're just going to get the debut done whoever that is focus on that get that done and then I, once the shows start happening again I want to fight as often as I possibly can um, you know it will be a case of if we have to book two three fights in a row and get ready for them and just go for them one after the other and I don't have any downtime then we'll do that yeah. you know I want to play catch up a little bit you know I just, I'm just raring to go yeah for sure we can in terms of advice for any young up-and-coming fighters in your similar situation frustrated there's not a lot happening like yeah. the covid's kind of in like what advice would you give them just use the time wisely you know um whatever equipment you've got use it to the best as best you can if you haven't got anything work on your cardio you know body weight stuff shadow boxing anything like that just do the best you can you know if you can make something up that you can hit and do it i mean in the first lockdown i didn't have a punch bag so i made one and then uh, a day later one of my sponsors actually sent me one which was great of them and it, which, yeah, nice. yeah, which, <laughs> wish, wish it had come a day a day earlier but you know it is what it is can't complain about. <laughs> but um you know i mean i've seen videos of guys um who don't have any equipment so they get like a cushion or a pillow and they tape it to a pole or tape yeah. it to, and start hitting that you know just do what you can just improvise you know be creative I think shadow boxing is one of the best things you can do in terms of your technique and just work on things and and stuff like that. So that's always a good thing. Just just do what you can. You know, you're never going to get the same sort of quality work that you can when you've got a full camp and a gym around you. But that doesn't mean you can't do anything. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think for a lot of people... Yeah, know. something is better than nothing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, sometimes when you... You know, it'll come out in your fight sometimes. Sometimes when you fight, it's not going to plan and you can't do all the techniques you want and it's not going right. And you just have to bullshit your way through it and sort of improvise and just adapt. And, you know, if you do that in your training, it's a lot easier to do that when you fight. So... Yeah, definitely. I think that's a lot of people when the when, obviously when the lockdown happened and the gyms were gone, a lot of people saw that as like, right, I just won't do anything until they're open again because I can't. Like a lot of people can't be bothered to kind of improvise and adapt with their surroundings. But the ones that do are the ones that will guess. I guess will like come out on top when it's all opened up again. Yeah, so you you'll see that when we when all the fight shows start happening, you'll see the guys who stuck with it throughout, and you'll see the guys who didn't, and you know you'll see a few guys come rising up through the top you know cream rises to the top and that's what's going to happen and this will think i think we'll sort of exaggerate it a little bit mm. in terms of who comes through and who doesn't but you know a lot of people are struggling with the lockdown and things like that so the guys who aren't training i'm sure they're just trying to get through it as best they can and you know some i have some days where i wake up and i just think you know what i'm just looking through today and i'm not even going to train because i'm just going to try and get through it and mm. you know again everyone's just got to do the best they can and sometimes yeah. the best you can is just getting through it yeah yeah definitely definitely doing something's better than nothing yeah luke have you got anything else you want to ask mate um yeah man um one of the the kind of questions that i always um think about whenever i'm watching fights or whenever i'm watching like the build-up um obviously you you know you touched on the the kind of camp um can you go into that a little bit you know what it's like how you are physically mentally what the kind of you know, what kind of happens. Obviously, I know you can't go into specifics yeah, for some things, um, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't mind going into specifics, but the problem is they're always different um, because we change our fight camp drastically depending on who we've got. If we've got someone who, uh, you know, let's say the game plan is to keep the fight standing. We'll work a lot on basic striking, you know, a jab, movement, things like that We're in our drilling. We'll pick like two or three combinations that we think will help depending on what, the specific guys open to or what habits yeah. he's got, things like that. And then it's a lot of takedown defense drills, a lot of sprawls, things like that. A lot of starting sort of like, we'll start like with the guy in our guard and where underneath we've been taken down and we have to stand up. You know, we just do endless, really, really basic day one drills like that over and over just again. Just repetitive. Just repetitive all the time. It gets horrendous. We hate it. All the guys hate fight <laughs> Um um, it's really basic. We don't do anything sort of out of the ordinary. It's just day one stuff because when you fight and it goes wrong or when you get hit or when you're under stress or whatever, it all goes out the window and you just go back to what you know. So we keep it really, really simple. And it's just, fight camp, I think, is horrendous. I hate it. Everyone hates it because everything is focused on you. So everyone knows what you're trying to do and everyone tries to ruin it because that's what we're doing. We're trying to sort of take on the role of the other guy you're fighting, if you know what I mean. Yeah, of course all your spiral partners trying to do that. So you're getting frustrated because you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's really boring. And you just have to sort of grind it out. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then if you're cutting weight, like a few of the guys cut weight, I don't, you know, you, you sort of deplete it a little bit because you're sort of trying to lose the weight and you're training harder than everybody else is. You know, you're doing two, three times a day, whatever. It, it's just a grind. It's just not very pleasant. <laughs> and then <laughs> It sounds intense. It's 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 sort of it is and it isn't. We have sort of, it's sort of intense in like the speed and the pace we do things. Yeah. But we never do sort of very hard sparring anything like that. I mean, the hardest sparring we do is a few weeks out from the fight, and essentially all we do is shark tank here. You know, let's say you're doing. Oh, hang on. <laughs> hang on. Sorry, That's my iPad's playing up. Uh, we have all kinds of technical difficulties on him. On him on We've right. had uh, fire alarms going off. Uh, <laughs> 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 so I think my charger's not working. Um, where was I? Can't remember where I was now. Quite camp. Yeah, yeah, so um, when we get into the sparring, sort of like the hardest sparring we do is about three or four weeks out. And all we do is shark tank. Let's say you've got a three or five round fight. We do three or five rounds with a fresh opponent every round. They all know what your game plan is. They all try and ruin it. Um, it you know, it, it's not it's not a strange sight to see me take my gloves off and throw them across the gym and storm <laughs> out. It, it's it's been it happens every fight camp at some point. Um, you know, it's just one of them things. It, we just try and we don't sort of make it so that you get beaten up. 
we just mm. make it so that you're as frustrated and as just basically desperate as you possibly can be. Because that way, when we sort of fight, like I've been put in bad positions in fights a lot and you just, you, it doesn't even phase you because you've been there for the last five weeks. You know, you get stuck in a bad, you get stuck on the mound, you get stuck here, you get stuck there. It's just like, right, okay, I've been here before. It just doesn't even phase you. You know, there's yeah. nothing worse than getting stuck in a bad position and you've had a great fight camp where you've beaten everybody up and no one can hurt you and all of a sudden you're on your back. Yeah. So it's just all about making you as desperate as possible and just being able to deal with it for us as well. And obviously working the game plan as much as possible. Yeah, definitely. And then obviously looking forward to the celebration after the fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, no, that's brilliant, mate. I mean, yeah, that's one thing you hear a lot of fighters saying that like, you're, the fight should be much easier than the camp you've just been through. Like, I've seen a lot of fighters come out and say their sparring partners gave them more trouble than the actual fighter did. I don't know whether that's just a bit of shit talking or what. But No, I think, it, I think it usually is because, you know, when you're in fight camp, you're generally training two, three times a day. You, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to build yourself up. You're putting yourself in the worst case scenarios to try and deal with that at the time. And then when you get into the cage, you know, you're in there, you're, you're fully rested. You've had a big feed after you've weighed in and you've got the adrenaline and everything like that. And you know what the guy's going to do or you, you know to a degree what the guy's going to do and you've got a game plan. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that, you know, my worst days have definitely been inspiring rather than in the cage. Mm. Well, I mean, one thing, I've kind of covered everything I wanted to ask, Luke, unless you've got anything. No, no, man. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It was, uh, yeah, it was uh, a lot of good insights. What I want to round off on, and this is a bit of a silly like fan question, but I'm just interested to get a fighter's perspective because it's a big debate at the moment. Like, yeah. Greatest of all time in mixed martial arts. You hear the same sort of names. You've got your Anderson Silva, GSP, John Jones <laughs> and Khabib. Yeah. Who is it for you? GSP, all day yeah. long. Yeah, all day long, GSP. Um, I mean, he, he's so well-rounded. Um, but also as well, he, he, he's clever. You know, you look at the things he does. He adapts to things. He changes his game plan. You know, he started off as sort of like, at one point, he was just sort of like a wrestler. And, and you know, he was very one-dimensional. And then he, he'd come back and he'd be working with Freddie Roach and he, yeah. he worked on his jab and things like that. The man's a thinker, you know. He thinks, he plans things out. He always has a good game plan. He's one of the smartest fighters you'll ever see. And he's got all the skills everywhere to yeah. sort of match that. I don't think there's any question on it. You yeah, know, no, I think the, the, the person I'd probably have... After him, if you were going to contend, it would probably be Anderson Silva or John Jones, depending on what your stance on steroids is. Because we, all know, <laughs> we all know John Jones' reputation. I know Anderson Silva got popped, but that yeah. was sort of like late in his career, I think. And before that, he was just untouchable when he never, he never tested positive then. So I'd probably say Anderson Silva, but it depends on what your stance is and those sort of things. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, yeah, John Jones, while he was on the... On the, <laughs> he was also smashing gear quite consistently, which I'm sure doesn't oh, yeah, do you yeah. any favours. <laughs> I mean, John Jones is hilarious. If I ever want to laugh, I just look at John Jones and the sort of stuff he gets like hiding yeah. under a cage and just make me die. Yeah, basically. that story is fucking brilliant. Have you heard <laughs> that, Luke? But no, no, go for it. This is before they had USADA, and it was uh, the testing was a bit different. Like you could get away with a bit more, but he just mm. been he just been smoking a joint, and they tested. They turned up to drug test him, so he hid under a ring for like eight hours. <laughs> and they were like walking around the gym like where is he and everyone's like I don't know he's gone out he's gone out but yeah he hid under the ring for eight hours he's a fucking joker <laughs> <laughs> well look Jimmy mate um, it's Sunday so we won't keep you for much longer so thank you so much for coming on mate yeah, my pleasure guys I'm hoping yeah man thank you very much yeah, obviously anyway, uh, just before we do wrap up obviously um, you know um Follow, uh, all, obviously, all the social medias, Instagram at Featuring Regular People. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube, Spotify. Uh, we have to do this every single episode because we just want to push out, you know, yeah, these conversations so much. And yeah, there's a lot of energy that, uh, you know, the guests put in to, to make these well, uh, to make these good. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And then, obviously, Jimmy's, uh, what's your social media again? Uh, it's Tomahawk MMA on Instagram. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do I want to give that um, but, response as well? Um, Got Your Health UK, who do all my supplements and everything like that. Uh, Jim Hearn is one step apart. He keeps me on the mat. If you're an athlete and you get injuries, anything like that, you need to go and see him. And then I've got um, VXS Gym, where I do all my sports power, all my training gear. And I've got a new one coming up, Street Kings, who, again, all sporting equipment. You know, these guys, they keep me training. You know, they help me out. They give me stuff. Um, they give me support. 
you know, nice. without them, I probably wouldn't be training. So yeah. they definitely deserve a shout out as well. And we'll put links to all that stuff in the bio as well, mate. So that everyone. Yeah, will be able thank to you very much. Action. And we'll put some links to some of your fights as well, if anyone wants to see Jimmy in action. And hopefully, yeah, man, I'm excited to see you next time. A few yeah, months down the go. line, or whenever, we'll get you back on just to see. Yeah, where yeah you're absolutely. Back. I'd love to, you guys, anytime. Anytime. Oh, thank you very much, mate.